Uh, so good evening and welcome to the Royal Society. I've been talking all day, so I'm sorry, I'm about to lose my voice, which isn't the best thing when they're trying to uh, record you. Um, my name's Alex Halliday. I'm the physical secretary of the Royal Society. Um, in case you wonder whether a physical secretary is just physical and we have a virtual one as well, uh, my counterpart is John Scale, who's the biological secretary, who normally would introduce tonight's occasion, but he's over in Washington uh, at this major conference, you know, that's going on about gene editing right now. So he's uh, busily tied up over there. Uh, but this is a great opportunity for me because it gives me a chance to really learn something new. And uh, it's a wonderful occasion for me as well. So uh, tonight we're uh, going to be hearing from Professor Rob Close, who's been awarded the 2015 Francis uh, Crick Lecture and Award. Uh, we're going to be hearing about his research in understanding how chromatin-based and epigenetic processes contribute to gene regulation. Uh, the Francis Crick Medal, uh, for those of you who don't know much about it, uh, and lecture, is given annually in any field in the biological sciences. However, preference is usually given to genetics, molecular biology, and neurobiology, the general areas in which Francis Crick himself worked. Uh, and also the fundamental theoretical work, which was a hallmark of Crick science. Let me tell you a bit about our speaker tonight. Um, Professor Rob Close completed his BSc, his bachelor's in biology, at the University of Waterloo in Canada. From there, he moved to the University of Edinburgh, where he carried out his PhD, studying how proteins that recognize methylated DNA are involved in gene regulation and disease. During his postdoctoral work at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the US, he helped to discover a new class of enzymes that can remove epigenetic modifications on chromatin. In 2008, he set up his own research program at the University of Oxford in the Department of Biochemistry as a Wellcome Trust Research Fellow, where he investigates the function of CG island gene regulatory elements in vertebrates. During this time, his group has made a series of important discoveries, demonstrating that CG islands are actively read by chromatin-modified enzymes in the cell to shape the epigenome and play widespread roles in controlling gene expression. In 2014, Rob was named Professor of Cell and Molecular Biology and Monsanto Senior Research Fellow at Exeter College, Oxford. Please welcome tonight's speaker, Professor Rob Close. Okay, good. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, at the back? Great. Wonderful. So, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Alex for the kind uh, introduction, and also the uh, Royal Society for giving me the opportunity to be here tonight and deliver the Francis Crick Lecture, and share with you some of the work that we do in my laboratory, trying to understand how this beast called the epigenome is involved in controlling the way our genes and genetic information are used. And what I'd like to do over the next 45 minutes or so is just really give you a, a broad overview of, of why this the, understanding these systems is important, and then go into some of the details of the experimental work that we do in my lab, trying to discover how these processes work inside of cells. And really, by way of introduction, what I'd like to do is just take a minute to contemplate a rather remarkable event that allowed us to all be here tonight. And I'm not talking about braving the London Underground to get here in time for this evening's lecture. Instead, I'm talking about an event that for some people, depending on how old they are, happened a long time ago, and some people more recently. And this is the coming together of two very, very highly specialized cells, one in the form of an egg from our mother, mother and one in the form of a sperm from our father. Uh, in an event that I don't really want to go into any great graphic detail to describe, these two cells were able to fuse to form a single fertilized egg. And this was essentially the beginning of each and every one of us. Now what happens during this process, uh, the important thing that happens during this process, is the coming together of our genetic information. This is formed by the donation of 23 chromosomes from our mother and 23 chromosomes from our father which ultimately forms the, the complement of 46 chromosomes, which make up our genome and our genetic information. 
So once we have this genetic information, it's actually stored in these, these little um, chromosomes that I've shown here. And if we just go in and we take a, a zoomed in view and look a little bit more closely at these chromosomes, it turns out that this genetic information is actually stored in a very, very specialized molecule called DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. And what I've shown here is just a cartoon actually of the structure of DNA. And many of you will probably recognize this. This is perhaps, what, perhaps one of the most recognizable and iconic images in all of biology. And really it was made famous by the uh, work of Francis Crick, after whom this lecture is named, and his colleague James Watson in the early 50s. When they first proposed a structure, a double-stranded DNA structure for DNA. This work ultimately garnered them a share of the Nobel Prize and the reason that this was so important is, at the time, the nature of our genetic information actually remained somewhat contentious. And the reason for this is that any molecule, even if it was DNA, in order for it to be the hereditary component that I've just described to you of genetic information, it would have to have the capacity to be copied when cells divide or when you pass information across um, generations. And really, um, through proposing a double-stranded helix, for DNA, Watson and Crick realized that they could potentially also explain how DNA could have a hereditary property. And I'm just going to describe that in a little bit more detail to you now by first um, flattening out this double-stranded helix and just showing you how it's built. So the double-stranded helix they proposed had a, a strand of DNA running in one direction with bases that point off of us. So our DNA is made up of four bases, which we generally just refer to as letters. So these are A, C, T, and G. And in the context of their structure, there was an alternative strand, a second strand of DNA, I should say, that actually ran in the opposite direction. And what they proposed is that there would be highly stereotypical interactions between C and G and T and A. <coughs> And what they immediately realized in the context of this double-stranded DNA helix is that if you needed to copy this information, you could do this very easily by just separating these two strands. And if this base pairing could be reinstated, you could easily recopy this original DNA sequence, making a, a true copy of its starting material. And if you did this to both strands, you could create two new copies of DNA that looked exactly like the starting material. And subsequently, others went on to demonstrate that indeed it's this semi-conservative DNA replication that underpins our ability to copy our genetic information and pass it on. So not only did their structure propose a mechanism for how DNA could be copied and the hereditary material, the linear nature of this double-stranded molecule also meant that there, depending on the order in which these base letters existed in the sequence, there was also the potential to code information or to store information within this DNA. And it's really the latter aspect of DNA that I want to concentrate on in a little bit more detail this evening. This is its ability to code information. And so in order to do this, what I'm going to do is just take this DNA structure, this cartoon shown here, and I'm going to simplify it down to a simple red line that I'll show throughout the lecture that corresponds to DNA. Now what we've learned through studying genetics and also through understanding more about DNA sequence is that this um, information that is encoded within our genome often occurs in very specialized elements called genes. And if we go in and if we look at the DNA sequence within these genes, it turns out that the information that's stored within them is found in a very special way. It's found in a, a triplet code of bases, as I've shown here. Now it turns out that DNA inside of our cells is actually a rather inert molecule. It doesn't really do anything. So what the cell does is uses a machinery called the transcriptional machinery that transcribes this DNA encoded information into a second nucleic acid called an mRNA. This mRNA retains this triplet encoded information. And then at other places in the cell, this mRNA can be read by the translational machinery to produce a special type of molecule called a protein. So if we go back to our fertilized egg that I showed you a minute ago, it turns out that these proteins actually make up much of the structure that forms how this cell looks. And not only that, there's a very specialized type of protein called an enzyme that can actually move around within our cell and carry out processes, do things. And it's really these proteins that help our cells to come alive. <clears throat> 
If we go in and we look at our chromosomes and our genome that I just described to you a minute ago, it turns out that we have about 25,000 of these genes that encode for proteins. So if we now go back to our, our fertilized egg that I've shown here, we have this complement of genetic information in the form of chromosomes that encodes these 25,000 genes and essentially this blueprint for how to make you and I. But of course, we're not just made up of one cell. We're made up of very, very, a, a very a, a large number of cells. And therefore, this, this fertilized egg now must undergo a rather major transformation. Uh, what it must do is it must grow. It must copy its DNA, DNA using a mechanism that I just described to you a minute ago. And then it must um, insert this new copy or blueprint of our genome into each of these new cells that it produces. And in you and I, over the next nine months, this cell must go through this process over and over and over again until ultimately we're formed of somewhere on the order of 40 trillion cells. And so this makes up all the tissues and the organs that are, that are necessary for us to exist as complex multicellular organisms. And really this fertilized egg um, f during this process will form over 200 different cell types. And these are all necessary for these specialized processes that our bodies um, carry out. And I think this transformation is perhaps best exemplified by simply going in and looking at some examples of these specialized cells in you and I. So again, we're starting with this fertilized egg here. And if we now fast forward to this fully formed human and we look at a specific type of organ, for example, if we go in and look at the eye and take a cross section of the retina, what I can hope you, hope you can realize is that this rather round looking inert cell is now transformed into something very different these very elongated sort of purple and mauve colored cells, which are the rods and cones in our retina. Now, not only do these cells look very different, it turns out that they're also very different in, with respect to how they function. These cells have specialized to collect light information and send it to our brains so that we can see what's happening in the world around us. Now, if you go to another region of the body, for example, an artery that you might find in your leg, you'll see something very, very different. Now we see a series of these green cells that exist to form the blood vessel wall, the wall of uh, the artery that, that holds the fluid, which is the blood that runs through it. And now if we look inside this blood vessel, you can see that there's even more specialized cells. We have red, red blood cells that carry oxygen, informa uh, oxygen throughout our body. And we also have these uh, little yellow cells, which are actually part of our immune system that help to ward off infection. And what we've realized through studying development and how these cells form and become specialized is that in order to do this, they have to have the capacity to use a defined subset of these 25,000 genes that I've described to you. And the really key thing is that they must be able to express, which is just a fancy way of saying use, the right subset of these genes at the right time and the right place in order to form these highly specialized cells. So to just um, illustrate this uh, slightly more simply, for example, if you were to look at one of these purple cells in the retina, it might want to express a subset of the genes B and C, whereas these little yellow cells that are part of the immune system might want to um, express a different subset of these genes, genes A and B. So in thinking about this, I think one thing that probably becomes obvious is then that ev because every cell essentially has exactly the same genetic information, DNA, there must be a rather elaborate set of mechanisms then in order to control the way these individual genes are used in these defined cell types. And very interestingly, through studying this, what we've learned is actually that the information necessary to control how genes are used is actually encoded within the DNA sequence itself. Now this occurs in the context of very specific elements called gene regulatory elements. I'm just going to show them as little blue box here. And they encode information necessary to control the use of the gene. But in contrast to this, um, uh, in contrast to this uh, protein coding DNA information, these gene regulatory elements do this in a slightly different way. They actually encode short DNA sequences that can be recognized by a very specialized type of protein called a DNA binding transcription factor. Now what this DNA binding transcription factor then does is help to control the way an enzyme called polymerase can engage with genes. And it's this polymerase enzyme that ultimately transcribes the DNA sequence uh, 
into this mRNA that can lead to protein production. Now, it turns out that this general, um, this general mechanism for controlling gene expression is, con is, is shared across all forms of life, from the most simple bacteria, single-celled bacteria, all the way up to you and I. Uh, all the way up to you and I. And, but the, uh, the main differences between these simple single-celled organisms and you and I is actually the number of genes that are found in our genome and actually the size and complexity of our genomes. So, for example, our genome actually is made up of three billion of these base pair letters that I described to you a minute ago. This is absolutely massive. And really, to give you an idea of the scale of this, if you want, you can go down to the Wellcome Trust Collection on Houston Road, where they've quite kindly printed out all three billion base pairs of DNA and A4. I, I think you can realize this is probably something you're not going to curl up with on a cold night to read. Um, it's rather daunting, even by the size of this man here. But this actually uh, is, uh, so this is, this is very interesting. This is a huge genome. But what really is fascinating about it with respect to genes and gene regulatory elements is that this actually, these elements actually account for a very, very small percentage of our genome. Depending on how you, you identify them, this is somewhere on the order of about 5% of our entire genome. And indeed, it turns out that we understand very little about what vast amounts of our genome are actually doing. And this is a very, very active area of research at um, the moment. Um, uh, yes, uh, active research at the moment. So um, the fact that, um, the fact that this, these gene regulatory elements and genes encompass such a small proportion of our genome actually poses a rather um, important or, or challenge, if you will, for the cell. And that is, how is it that these um, transcriptional machinery in the polymerase itself can actually recognize this small proportion of the genome where it can actually engage with genes and control how proteins uh, are being used. And I think this is um, best illustrated, actually, by just considering transcription factors and their DNA binding sequences. So um, often, transcription factors bind short DNA sequences that are often even degenerate in nature. This means in large genomes like ours, these sequences will exist simply by chance in many places in the genome. However, we know through studying the way transcription factors work in our genome that they often disfavor these sequences that are off in the middle of, of nowhere in our genome and not near genes, and instead tend to be concentrated around regions where they can control genes and contribute to the utilization of this underlying DNA sequence. In addition, it turns out that polymerase, this enzyme that transcribes genes, is actually a rather dumb enzyme. If you put it into a test tube with DNA, it will begin to transcribe just about anything. Yet when we look inside our cells, we know that polymerase is localized mostly to where genes are, and it tends to be focusing its activity on transcribing these genes. So I think what these observations are beginning to tell us is that there must be additional mechanisms in our large mammalian and human genomes to help control the way that this transcriptional machinery is able to identify its appropriate regions in the genome and therefore utilize this DNA-encoded gene information. And one simple way that the cell seems to do this is actually by limiting access of factors to DNA. So it turns out inside of the cell that actually DNA is wrapped around proteins called histones, these little blue blob that I've shown here, in order to form these uh, elements called um, nucleosomes. And it's these nucleosomes that make up what we call chromatin, and the chromatin is the structure that makes up these chromosomes that I showed you at the beginning of the lecture. So what these, there's really two reasons that, um, that chromatin exists. One is actually to help package this absolutely enormous amount of DNA that we have within the very small confines of our nucleus. But as I said, the other thing it does is actually limit access of factors that read DNA to the underlying DNA sequence, including transcription factors and the transcriptional machinery. Now, at a first glance, this might seem counterintuitive, but it turns out that what the cell has evolved to do is use this chromatin structure to then further regulate the way transcriptional machinery is able to engage with genes in the genome. And one way that it does this is actually using um, so-called epigenetic modifications. And what we know through studying the, the epigenome, which I'll come to in a minute, is near gene regulatory elements that I've described to you here, 
Um, what, this, uh, what, the, what the cell does is it uses specific enzymes that can add epigenetic modifications to these histones, these little blue things that make up chromatin, and adding these little chemical tags, which I've just shown here as a green tag. And what it turns out is that these epigenetic modifications can then influence the way this chromatin behaves. In some, in some cases, it can transition these gene regulatory elements into more permissive epigenetic or chromatin states. I'll use these two words sort of interchangeably, chromatin state and epigenetic state. In addition, it can also transition gene regulatory elements into a more restrictive epigenetic state. In addition to these epigenetic states that exist near gene regulatory elements, the cell also has very broad brush mechanisms whereby epigenetic modifications can be added to histones actually throughout large swathes of the genome on both histones and actually DNA itself. And what these broad brush mechanisms appear to do is actually silence large regions of the genome that don't have genes or gene regulatory elements. So it's really the compendium, really, of these epigenetic modifications, which is generally referred to as the epigenome. And for the purposes of this evening's lecture, I'm just going to refer to the epigenome as any information which is stored on chromatin in the, in the form of these modifications which isn't directly encoded within the DNA base pair sequence itself. Now, it turns out there's a whole field of study which is based on understanding whether these epigenetic modifications are copied when DNA is replicated and deposited into daughter cells or even carried across um, generations. This is not going to be the focus of my lecture this evening. I'd be happy to talk about it afterwards if people are, are interested. Instead, what I want to focus on tonight is understanding how it is that these chromatin and epigenetic modifications help to control the way gene regulatory elements and genes are used in our large genomes. And this is becoming particularly important because we now realize that actually if you perturb these epigenetic systems, much like deleting or altering genes themselves, that this can have rather profound effects on the way our genes are used in our genome. And in fact, when you perturb uh, components of the epigenetic system, this can actually lead to certain human diseases like cancer and even inherited human diseases. So understanding how these epigenetic processes work is turning out to be rather important. In particular, some of the problems, that, uh, some of the things that we really don't understand about this system are how these epigenetic landscapes, these, these profiles of these epigenetic modifications are set up in the first place, and then furthermore, how it is that they affect genes and gene regulatory elements in helping to control the way our DNA encoded information is used. And these are really the two central questions that we aim to address in, in the work that I do in, in, in my laboratory. And the way that we've started to study this actually about seven or eight years ago when I, when I came to Oxford to set up my own group was really by focusing in on one of these very specific epigenetic modifications. And this is a modification that doesn't occur actually on the histones, it occurs on the DNA sequence itself. And this uh, epigenetic modification is called DNA methylation. It occurs in our genomes on a very specific combination of DNA bases when C is found next to G. And what this epigenetic modification, I'm not going to show the chemistry of it, it's just the addition of a small methyl group to the uh, C base on both strands of our DNA. Now, it turns out that we've, through studying DNA methylation, we've learned a reasonable amount about where it is in the genome and what it does. So uh, in our genomes, uh, of the 30 million or so CG combinations of bases there are, about 80 to 90 percent of them exist in this methylated form. And actually, these methylated bases are, are spread largely throughout the genome. And this, is, this appears to be one of these epigenetic modifications, which is a broad brush mechanism largely silencing regions of the genome that don't have genes or gene regulatory elements. Now, DNA methylation is actually a rather interesting epigenetic modification because it's rather binary in nature. D CGs can either exist in this methylated form or alternatively lack methylation, and I just show this as little open lollipops uh, on CG dinucleotides. Now, through studying where the non-methylated DNA is in the genome, we've actually learned that it's quite different than the methylated DNA. Instead of being spread out throughout the genome, it's largely concentrated around these gene regulatory elements and near genes, and actually exists as short contiguous regions of the genome that are often very CG-rich. 
These regions were originally called CG islands when they were first discovered about 30 years ago because they were islands of CG-rich DNA that was non-methylated amongst this sea of heavily methylated genome. But despite the fact that we've known about these CG islands for a very, very long time, it turns out that we understand very little or anything, any, actually anything about what it is they're, they're doing in the genome and whether they might be related to gene regulatory element function. And this is rather surprising to me because it turns out that actually about two-thirds of our genes are associated with one of these epigenetic, uh, epigenetically specified CG islands. As I've already said, they often encompass gene regulatory elements, suggesting that potentially they could play some role in the way we utilize this underlying DNA-encoded information. And thirdly, very interestingly, they remain free of DNA methylation in, in virtually all cells in our body, regardless of whether the gene they're associated with is being actively transcribed or used. So this suggests that CG islands might actually be some sort of epigenetic marker of where genes are in the genome. So when I started my group in Oxford about seven or eight years ago now, um, we were really interested in understanding, actually, the, the, um, trying to tackle, really, an understanding of what it is that these CG island regions might actually be doing in our genome. And in beginning to think about this problem, we actually first took a bit of inspiration from work that had been already done on the DNA methylation system, where we'd realized that there's actually a group of proteins that can specifically bind to CGs when they're in their methylated state. And these proteins can then affect the way the surrounding genome and DNA sequence is being used. So we wondered at the time whether there might be a complementary group of proteins that could read where these CG island regions were in the genome and perhaps recognize these elements in DNA, potentially to act as an effector of what islands are doing in the genome. And this wasn't a completely crazy idea because it turned out about 15 years ago, um, David Skelnick's group in America, through studying synthetic DNA sequences, had identified a specific type of protein that has a CXXE domain that could specifically bind to non-methylated CGs, but was blocked from binding these same sequences when they were methylated. So such a protein reader or DNA binding domain would have the exact sort of properties of something that might have the capacity to read and recognize these CG island regions of the genome. And this was really something we were very keen to go and address inside of cells to ask whether this was reading where CG islands are in the genome. So in order to do this, what we needed to do is to carry out an experiment. And I'm going to just describe that experiment to you um, very briefly now because it's something that we use extensively in the lab. And I'll show data that uh, originates from this experiment throughout the remainder of the lecture. Now, this experiment is called a chromatin immunoprecipitation experiment. And the way it works is that we're able to go inside cells and add a special sort of molecular glue. And what it allows us to do is irreversibly stick this protein on the region of the genome which it's physically associated with. We then go in with a special pair of molecular scissors that allows us to fragment the genome up into tiny little pieces. We then add a special molecular magnet called an antibody that allows us to pull these proteins away from the rest of the genome, still bound to their DNA sequence, and then wash away the rest of the material that isn't bound by these proteins. We're then able to go in and use a, a really a revolutionary new technology that has just come online in our field in the last five or six years, which allows us to go in and actually identify the sequence that is bound of DNA, which is bound to millions and millions of these proteins. With this sequence information in hand and a genome that we know all the base pairs of, we can actually go back in and align these bits of DNA that were bound to protein back onto the original genome. We can, because we're doing this millions and millions of times, we can also get a view of roughly how many proteins were bound at any given region in the genome. And so what we exploited this technology to do was ask the simple question of whether this CXXE domain was reading and binding to these CG island regions in the genome. So now what I'm going to show you is the outcome of this experiment. This is a real region of our genome shown here. It looks a bit different than the schematic that I showed you a minute ago, because it turns out that genes actually point in different directions in our genome, and that's just indicated by these arrows here. And these little black bars that indicate the protein coding regions of uh, the DNA sequence are actually um, interrupted in the genome, so they look like they take up more space. But nevertheless, if we go in and we map where these CG islands are by just showing them as these little green boxes, and we now align this uh, sequencing information back to the genome, 
what I hope you can see is there are peaks where this protein appears to have been residing in the genome. And if we look closely at where these sites are, they're exactly at the regions where CG islands are in our genome. So what this appears to show us is that this CXXC domain can indeed bind these CG island regions of the genome. And when we look across the entirety of the genome at the 20,000 or so CG islands that exist and just map the binding that occurs at these sites, what I hope you can realize is that it's exquisitely localized to these CG island regions of the genome. So in the context of these experiments, what we've identified here is a protein DNA binding domain that can recognize these epigenetic elements called CG islands. So for the remainder of the talk, what I'm going to do is just simplify this schemata. I'm going to take away these little lollipops that indicated where methylated and non-methylated DNA are. For the remainder of the talk, all we need to remember is that these non-methylated CG islands will be indicated by this little green box. So what we have here is a domain then that can read the epigenome, the underlying DNA methylation state. So then now that we know that something can actually read this, the question was, well, what does this CG island reading module actually do in the genome? And does it do anything to these genes that it's found near? Now, it turns out that we understand a bit more about this protein than I've led on, this, this blue protein that has a CXXC domain. It actually has a name, and the name of this protein is KDM2A, which stands for lysine-specific uh, demethylase 2A. And when I, was a, uh, when I was in North America at Chapel Hill, my colleagues and I were actually studying this group of proteins. And what we realized is that they're actually enzymes. And we, we figured out what these enzymes are actually doing, at least in vitro. And it turns out that what KDM2A is, is an enzyme that actually affects chromatin. And what it does is it works on a very specific type of epigenetic modification. And what we showed, at least in a test tube, is that this protein can bind to chromatin and remove a very specific type of epigenetic modification effectively resetting this chromatin structure or chromatin state. Now, the epigenetic modification that it works on is an epigenetic modification on histones. And for those of you who know a bit about this, this is um, a, a very specific position on histone H3, and this is lysine 36, and it occurs as a mono or dimethyl mark. Nevertheless, um, what we know is that this enzyme then can actually remove this inside a test tube, and therefore it might be doing this inside a cell. So the question in part was, well, what does this epigenetic modification do, and how might this molecule be regulating this? Um, and it turns out we understand a bit about this epigenetic modification that I've shown as a black flag here. In our genome, it's one of these epigenetic modifications, which is very abundant. It's one of these broad brush mechanism uh, epigenetic uh, modifications found throughout the genome. And through studying this in various different organisms, what we've learned is that this modification is actually inhibitory to engagement of the transcriptional machinery. Therefore, we wondered whether KDM2A might actually be functioning in the genome then to read where these CG island regions of the genome are and remove this epigenetic modification, which is generally thought to be involved in silencing. So in order to ask this question, we went again back inside cells and, and carried out an experiment, again using chromatin immunoprecipitation. And the experiment we did is to actually go in and look at a series of these genes and gene regulatory elements in the genome. I'm just going to show you an example of one gene which exemplifies what we found essentially in every, every place that we looked in the genome. So if you go in and you look at a real example of a gene, this is a gene serpent B8. It's pointing in this direction, and here is its CG island. As I showed you before, this CXXC domain can read and bring this protein to the CG island. But most importantly, when we go in and look at the epigenetic modification that this enzyme can remove, it is also, it is also depleted precisely at the place in the genome where KDM2A sits, suggesting that KDM2A may be involved in removing it from these sites. So we were very keen to test whether that was indeed the case. And so what we used is a genetic trick where we can reduce the levels of KDM2A and that's just shown here. We see the enzyme is no longer occupying this in the same way. And now when we go in and we look at this epigenetic modification, we see that its levels go up. And indeed, what we're seeing is that this modification is now encroaching into these gene regulatory elements where it normally wouldn't be. So I think what this is telling us is in the context of our genomes, what this epigenome reader is doing is it's moving along the genome it's binding to these CG islands and removing this silencing epigenetic mark, which is spread out throughout the genome. 
And based on these observations, what we propose is that KDM2A therefore might be highlighting these gene regulatory elements potentially as a way of creating a landing site for the transcriptional machinery so that it can focus its efforts near genes and gene regulatory elements instead of these vast regions of the genome which don't have genes and can't be involved in producing protein coding, uh, in, in producing proteins. And in sort of in support of this observation, actually if you go in and you look across the genome at its physical accessibility, what we find is that these CG island regions are actually some of the most accessible regions in our entire genome. So this is very interesting because I think it suggests that these systems are reading the underlying DNA methylation-based epigenome to help highlight these alternative, uh, to help highlight these gene regulatory elements and make them perhaps more accessible to the machinery that can actually use them. So I also told you at the beginning of the talk, in addition to this highlighted state that I've just described to you, that gene regulatory elements where CG ions are found can also exist in alternative epigenetic states, either being modified so that they're more permissive or more restrictive to engagement of the transcriptional machinery. So we wondered, with whether, we wondered whether this might also be related to the functionality of these CG islands. And this was based on the observation that actually many of these alternative epigenetic states are highly coincident with where CG islands and gene regulatory elements are in the genome. So the question really was, well, do CG islands and potentially a reading mechanism help to contribute to the formation of these alternative chromatin states near um, gene regulatory elements. And again, this was a reasonably sensible idea or hypothesis because it turns out that there isn't just one CXXE domain containing protein in our genome. It turns out that there's actually about 11 or 12 of them. They all utilize this domain to recognize CG islands. But most interestingly, they're also almost all enzymes. And they're almost all enzymes that affect epigenetic modifications by either removing or adding them. So these additional proteins were actually excellent candidates for molecules that might be able to transition these highlighted regions of the genome into sites that were then either more permissive or restrictive to engagement by the transcriptional machinery. So we and others were really keen to go in and understand whether this was indeed the case, whether these, these islands were really helping to shape our epigenome. And, um, uh, and we, we began to go in and systematically examine the function of these additional enzymes. And actually, the first evidence that these proteins might be involved in changing these local, local epigenetic states came not from work done in our lab, but instead worked on in, in David Skalnick's group and Adrian Bird's group in Edinburgh. And what they discovered through studying a protein called CFP1 is that this molecule, actually also having a CXXE domain, um, uh, can recognize CG island elements. But instead of being an enzyme itself, it turns out that this CFP1 molecule actually physically associates with an enzyme or an enzyme complex called the SET1 complex. And what they demonstrated is that CFP1 can bind to CG islands, much like KDM2A. But instead of removing an epigenetic mark, it actually places one. Now, this epigenetic modification is the addition of a methyl group to a very specific um, uh, histone molecule, the histone H3, at position 4 in its tail. And instead of being a, a repressive or a, or a silencing epigenetic mark, this mark is, is actually thought to be permissive to engagement and the functionality of the transcriptional machinery. So based on this observation, we were actually very keen to go in and understand whether this local epigenetic um, transition might actually help to contribute to the way the transcriptional machinery was actually using uh, this associated gene. So to do this, what we did is we went in again and did an experiment. And the experiment was first based around generating a very special type of cell that we could add a, a small molecule, a drug to, that would allow us to rapidly remove this CFP1 protein. Um, so we did this, and we've, we've examined this at, uh, across the entirety of the genome. I'm just going to show you one gene which exemplifies essentially what we found. This is the SNHG12 gene. Uh, this is the, the gene regulatory element here, and this is the CG island. Now, if we go in and look at where CFP1, this reader molecule, is binding, again, it found exactly where the CG island region is. And if we go in and look at the epigenetic modification that it places, it's, it's completely coincident with where these island and gene regulatory element are. Now, if we go in and add a drug that allows us to remove this protein, what we find is that this epigenetic modification is now dramatically reduced. And in fact, when we look across the entirety of the genome, 
what we find is that actually it's the most actively transcribed genes that appear to lose this epigenetic mark without CFP1. So the genes that are actually being most used, and this is actually in fitting with observations from, from Adrian Bird's lab as well, which have done similar experiments. But what we were really un interested in understanding is whether this alternative, more permissive epigenetic state may actually contribute to the way the associated gene was being used. And to do this, what we did is we went in and we looked at the amount of this mRNA, this molecule that is transcribed from the gene, being produced at, at this specific gene. We looked at it before, in the, so in the presence of CFP1, and also after we've deleted this protein. And now what we see is actually a rather dramatic reduction in the amount of the gene that's being used when you take away this epigenetic modification. Now when we look across the genome, we see a whole spectrum of different outcomes when we remove CFP1. Some genes are massively affected, others not so affected. But the general observation is, without this permissive epigenetic environment, the level of transcription appears to go down. So what we appear to be dealing with is a situation where, again, we've got a, a domain that can, can move along the genome and recognize where these CG island regions are, read the epigenome. And at sites where genes are being actively used or transcribed, it appears to play an important role in depositing this more permissive epigenetic state that appears to be important, at least in some instances, in helping to potentiate the way this gene is being used, suggesting that the ability to first highlight and then transition this gene regulatory element into more permissive epigenetic state is important for the ability to use this DNA-encoded information. So it appears that these additional systems are now helping to control the usage of these highlighted landing sites. And it actually, this appears to be important for maintaining or ensuring that, again, the right genes are being made in the right cell type. So I just want to quickly recap what I've told you so far. So we've got a system which includes KDM2A that reads where CG islands are in the genome, and it removes silencing modifications, helping to highlight where these regions are that contains genes and gene regulatory elements are. At genes that are being really highly utilized by the cell, this CFP1 system is important for placing permissive epigenetic modifications that are then important for maintaining the expression of these genes. And indeed, when we look across the entirety of the genome, what we actually find is that the majority of CG islands have transitioned into this more permissive epigenetic state and are often, uh, often being used by the transcriptional machinery as part of a process that appears to be important for ensuring these genes are being made in cells, uh, in the appropriate cells. Now, I also told you at the beginning of the lecture that it's uh, not only these permissive epigenetic states that um, uh, gene regulatory elements can exist in, but they can also transition into an alternative, more <coughs> restrictive epigenetic state. And here I've just indicated these regions by a red flag. This isn't one type of specific modification. It's actually a series of different modifications. But what these tend to do is now transition this more highlighted state into a more restrictive epigenetic or chromatin environment that appears to be important actually warding off low levels or inappropriate levels of this transcriptional machinery engaging with genes in certain cell types where this gene shouldn't be used. Now, people have studied these uh, restrictive systems for, for quite some time now, and we know that the molecules that are responsible for, for transitioning this, and this, they are called the polycomb repressive complexes. And what we've known for a long time is that the polycomb repressive complexes work almost exclusively at CG islands, but the mechanisms by which they select these appropriate genes to be put into this more restrictive state have remained very, very poorly understood. And based on the fact that they exist mostly at CG island regions, we again wondered whether the reading the CG island might contribute to the formation of this alternative, more restrictive epigenetic state. And really, the first hint that we got that this might be the case came from work that we were doing studying a protein called KDM2B that has one of these CG island reading domains. And the experiment that we were doing was a rather simple-minded experiment. What we were doing was just going into cells, reaching in, if you will, and pulling out this protein, and asking whether there was anything else physically associated with it that might explain how it could function inside of a cell. And I'm going to show you what we do. We just take these proteins and run them out on a, a gel. It's not really important what this is, but it's just a way of separating these proteins based on their size. So what we can, we can do is ensure that we've pulled out KDM2B, this protein I've shown you,
But what we observed when we ran these on a gel was that there was a whole series of additional proteins of, of unknown identity that appeared to be physically associated with KDM2B. And when we identified these, these proteins, it turns out that they formed a very specific complex called the polycomb repressive complex. Now, this was very interesting because I just described to you a second ago that these alternative, more restricted epigenetic states were driven or formed by this polycomb repressive complex. So we wondered whether KDM2B's ability to read where the CG island was in the genome may be responsible for transitioning to this alternative state. So again, we were keen to go in and really understand inside cells whether this was the case. And again, we did this by looking across the entirety of the genome, but I'm just going to focus on a, an example that shows you essentially what we found. So if we go in and we look at one of these more restricted epigenetic um, uh, gene regulatory elements, uh, at the TBX20 gene, if we go in and we look at where KDM2B is, it binds very precisely where the CG island is. But more importantly, when we go in and we look at this more restrictive epigenetic modification, it's precisely where KDM2B is sitting, suggesting again that it might be involved in setting this up. So to test this, we generated a, a very specific cell line where we could go in and just remove the ability of KDM2B to bind to DNA, to CG islands. And what we found now is this protein falls off of the gene, off of the gene regulatory element, but most importantly, we see that the levels of this epigenetic modification are now dramatically reduced, suggesting that KDM2B is playing a role or playing the central role in driving this. And actually, when we look across the genome at all regions that are in this more restricted state, we see a, a high percentage of these actually now lose this more restrictive epigenetic state. And actually, in a very small number of instances, we now see inappropriate engagement of the transcriptional machinery with these genes now allowing the production of genes in a cell type where they normally shouldn't be made. Interestingly, we also see that KDM2B can bind to actually all CG island regions in the genome. But despite this, it actually appears unable to shift sites that are being used or in this permissive epigenetic state into this restrictive state, suggesting there must be some way it controls or is blocked from working at these other regions of the genome. So I think what these observations are telling us is that KDM2B, much like the other molecules that I've described to you, are moving along the genome, associating with these CG island regions. At these sites that are being used or in a more permissive site, it can't install this restrictive epigenetic state. Instead, it's limited to these highlighted regions where genes aren't being used. Here it can deposit these epigenetic marks that transition this into a more restrictive state. And this appears to be important for warding off inappropriate transcription signals so that cells that don't want to make gene A don't, and these more permissive sites uh, appear to help the cell, once it's decided to use these genes, oops, to continue um, making them. So everything that I've shown you thus far in, in how these islands are highlighted and also then transition to alternative epigenetic states have been done in experiments that are done in what we call cell culture, in cells that are grown in a petri dish essentially outside of you and I. And this is actually necessary because many of the experiments are, are technically challenging to do inside animals. But I did tell you at the beginning of the talk that actually when these gene regulatory systems really need to come into their own is of course during development when you're forming these highly specialized cells that must use defined subsets of genes. So we were very keen really to go in and understand whether these systems were actually important for these developmental um, specification of how genes are used in cell types. Now, obviously, we can't do this inside of humans. This is not an ethical sort of experiment to do. Um, so instead, we turn to a, 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 a developmental system for a mammalian developmental system known as the laboratory mouse. And what we can do with the laboratory mouse is we can actually go in and manipulate its genome and actually take away the ability of this protein, KDM2B, which we're focusing our efforts on in, in, in animals, um, to take away its ability to bind CG islands and ask, as this mouse then develops without KDM2B, whether it can regulate normal gene expression and develop normally. Now, it turns out we have to remove two copies of KDM2B because as I told you at the beginning of the lecture, we get um, two copies of, of our, our genome, one, one from our mother and one from our father. So we must delete both copies of this gene. And when we do this, what we find is that actually, now if we go in and look at mice that don't have KDM2B, they actually fail to develop through embryology. Essentially, they form an embryo that has no embryonic tissue, or if it does, it's very um, misformed, suggesting these systems and their ability to transition 
the epigenetic states on islands are important for developmental gene regulation. Now, it's very difficult to study this in these mice because they don't develop properly. Things are a bit of a mess. So really to try and hone in on whether this is really due to inappropriate developmental gene control, we went and did a slightly milder experiment where we only removed one copy of KDM2B. Now the mice are a bit happier. They're still unhappy, but they make it through most of the early development in the embryo and actually born. So then this allows us to go in and actually look at the anatomy of this mouse to see if there's any defects. And the way that we do this is actually by looking at the skeleton of the newborn mouse. So this is what the skeleton looks like. It's got this sort of thoracic region, which is your rib region, which is intervened by a, a defined number of vertebrates, six, that links up to this sacral region, which is the sort of hip region. Now, in order to set this all up, you must express a right, the right set of genes at the right time to form this normal anatomy. And what we found in the mice that only had one copy of KDM2B is that this never seemed to work quite right. And this is just an example of one mouse where this is the case. So instead of having these six vertebrate here, now we only see five vertebrate. And we know actually through lots of work that people have done studying development of the mouse axial skeleton, as it's called, that this defect is actually caused by misregulation of a very specific subset of genes that are involved in setting up the body plan of the mouse. So it appears that these genes are being misregulated when we take away KDM2B. And I think what it shows is if you don't have the ability to transition into these alternative epigenetic states in your gene regulatory elements, these animals ultimately come to what is a pathology that, like, that equates to disease. So I think this says that KDM2B is playing an important role in helping not only to control gene expression in cells, but also during these important developmental transitions that lead to the right genes being produced at the right time in multicellular organisms. Now it turns out this isn't something special to KDM2B. If you remove any of the others, CFP1 or KDM2A, again this leads to embryonic lethality, suggesting that these systems are really at the center of ensuring that we get normal gene expression. And these mice really have major problems in controlling gene usage. So I think what this is telling us is the ability to highlight and then transition into these alternative epigenetic states is really playing a central role in helping to control how the underlying DNA information is both being read and ultimately used to produce proteins. So I think this is saying, saying to us these systems are very important. But actually what I've shown you in, this, in the lecture this evening is actually work that is, is very, um, very preliminary and sort of rudimentary in nature. And that, that is because we've, all we've really done is gone in and perturbed these systems and observed that processes that would normally happen in gene regulation or controlling gene uses don't work properly. And really now the next sort of, the next major thing that we really need to do is to go in and understand precisely how it is that these systems actually contribute to the way these genes are being used in a, in a very mechanistic way. And, and this is really important because if you go on, if you, we know that these systems go wrong in disease. If we're going to understand how they go wrong in disease, we first need to understand how they're normally working in a very mechanistic way. And so just giving you an idea of the kind of work that we're doing in the lab at the moment to to, to dig deeper, if you will, to go into the devil, the, the devil of the details that form this system, is that we're doing experiments, for example, at the moment to try and understand how the CFP1 protein, which I said is important for transitioning to this permissive epigenetic state, can read these regions of the genome that are being actively used by genes in order to achieve this. And we have interesting unpublished observations that have, have, have begun to indicate that perhaps CFP1 is reading not only the the, where the CG island region is, but also other epigenetic features associated with transcription. So really understanding how it senses these regions is very, very important. Furthermore, we're doing experiments to try and understand how this alternative molecule, KDM2B, is able to sense which regions of the genome are not being used, because we know it can't work efficiently at sites that are being actively transcribed, yet comes into its own when this gene is not being utilized by a given cell type. So understanding the biochemistry that underpins how these whole systems work, work, this switching system works, is going to be very, very important. Furthermore, a broader question that, that really plagues the field in general is, is just a simple understanding of how it is that these epigenetic modifications and states actually affect the way, oops, sorry, the way the transcriptional machinery engages with these sites of the genome. And it appears that there are maybe additional systems, or there are additional systems, that help to read these epigenetic features. And this is probably going to be at the crux of how the epigenome is involved in regulating gene expression. 
So in my last slide, I, what I'd like to do is just leave you with a few um, finishing sort of thoughts and, and a summary of the key points that I'd like you to leave with this evening. And the key thing, I suppose, is that although the genome, our large genome, has DNA-encoded information that is absolutely essential for guiding how transcription factors and the transcriptional machinery engage with genes to make uh, genes necessary for our cells to function, that actually in our large human and vertebrate genomes, that actually this is very much a collaboration with the epigenome. So the transcriptional machinery is limited in a large way to its access to the genome by nucleosomes. Large swathes of the genome can be put into these more silenced epigenetic states that really block away regions of the genome that don't have genes or gene regulatory elements. And what I've described to you tonight is a system that can read the underlying DNA methylation-based epigenome to identify where CG islands are near gene regulatory elements, and through KDM2A, highlight these as regions of the genome where perhaps transcription factors and polymerase can carry out their activities. We've identified additional systems that read these CG island regions and help to transition them into more permissive or restrictive epigenetic environments, depending on whether these genes are being used. And these processes, again, are very important for ensuring that the right genes are being made in the right cell types, not only in cell culture, but also in developing animals. And really, I think over the next sort of five to 10 years, it's going to be very exciting to understand in much more detail how these systems work. And this is going to be important because we know if you perturb the epigenome, that this can lead to human diseases like cancer and, and actually other inherited human diseases. So I think there's a great opportunity, oh, gosh, great opportunity for my laptop to die. <laughs> Sorry, just give me one second. Sorry, sort of lost some of the impact here. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, the ability really for us to understand this basic biology is going to be very important because we know if you perturb these systems that actually this, this is very important and can lead to human diseases. But in while, while this is obviously terrible from a biomedical perspective and a human perspective, it actually is, uh, is quite exciting to us because um, in, in contrast to mutations that perhaps happen in genes that would render this a gene completely ineffective, and this is something that's very difficult to fix in you and I. When you perturb the systems that set up the epigenome, this is often through affecting the way the enzyme works. So this provides us with a really interesting opportunity to potentially go in and take advantage of small molecule drugs that might allow us to help combat how these enzymes go wrong in, in certain diseases. And actually, there's a lot of interest in the pharmaceutical industry at the moment in leveraging this aspect of the epigenome to combat disease. And actually, there's already molecules in the clinic and many in, in phase one and two clinical trials that are targeted at really controlling how these systems go wrong in disease. So over the next five to 10 years, I think there's a really wonderful opportunity to leverage our new understanding of the basic biology that underpins how these systems work with potentially novel and new therapies in, in treating diseases affecting the epigenome. So with that, I would just like uh, to, to finish up by uh, acknowledging and thanking all the people that make this work possible. We're in the Department of Biochemistry in Oxford. Um, I'm a senior research uh, fellow at Exeter um, College. Um, the work in our, our lab is funded mostly by the Wellcome Trust, but also by EMBO and the Lister Institute of Preventive Medicine. But most importantly, the people that, uh, the current members of the lab, which are all shown here, um, these are the people that I really need to thank because it's these wonderfully talented and, and enthusiastic young people that, that make all of the sort of w w challenging work that we do in the lab possible. And being in a, an academic environment is really wonderful because I get to work with people all the way from undergraduates up to postdoctoral researchers. And they're the ones who really bring this, this exciting work in the lab to life. Finally, I'd just like to thank our collaborators throughout the world that make um, doing some of the more multidisciplinary work in the lab possible. Finally, I'd just like to thank you, and I'd be very pleased to take any questions. So uh, we're running a bit behind schedule, uh, but um, there's time for a couple of quick questions. And just to let you know, this is being webcast, so if you don't want to be seen on the web, uh, don't ask a question. There's a question right at the back. If you could wait for the microphone, please. Good evening. Can this uh, technology be used in RNA splicing as well to find out which introns are removed and which are still left behind? 
Yeah, um, so uh, you mean with respect to the epigenome, the epigenetic modifications? Yeah, so I didn't really go, I, I sort of glossed over a lot of, of the epigenetic modifications that don't exist right at gene regulatory elements, but it turns out over genes that are being transcribed, there's an alternative epigenetic state which is installed there. And it turns out that, that mod those modifications are actually very important in controlling how introns and exons are being spliced. Um, and if you perturb that, it can affect, affect those processes as well. Another question? One question here in the middle. All right. Yeah. Uh, does it follow from the process which you described that epigenomic uh, effects or epigenomes can't be transmitted between generations? Um, yeah, so th this is what I said I wasn't going to talk about during the talk. So there's a, there's, um, there's a whole field of study trying to understand how, these, how or if these processes might be transmitted across um, generations. So theoretically, yes, they could because there are modifications on DNA. Um, however, there's an immense drive in our germline, our sex cells, to actually wipe all of this stuff away before you transmit your genome on to the next generation. So um, most people think that most of this stuff is actually reset when you do that. There is some examples, particularly in plants actually, where some of the epigenome is carried through and this can have transgenerational effects. The evidence that the epigenome, as I've described it here this evening, is involved in those processes either in you and I, or even in some of those more simple vertebrate model systems like mice, are still, um, still a little bit controversial, actually, whether the epigenome, as I've described it, is, can underpin such transgenerational effects. But it's, it's a very interesting and very active area of research. Um, we're going to have to wrap this up, I'm afraid, but I'd just like to finish uh, by uh, saying the Francis Crick Lecture isn't just for an outstanding scientist, it's also for an outstanding speaker and lecturer, and it's been a wonderful example of how to explain something in very simple terms, even for a geologist. You know. um, so thank you very much indeed. There's a little present we give you, which is... Uh, a scroll, a medal, and a secret envelope. Uh, so uh, I'd like to congratulate you, congratulate you very much, Rob, on a wonderful lecture, fantastic performance, but also brilliant science. So, and this is a great way of honoring both you and the science that you do in your team. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.